All right, welcome, 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 welcome. We're, yeah, we're glad you're here. We our show is all about discussing the top lessons learned from this week's cyber stories. We've got Forrest here. He's like our Swi cyber Swiss Army knife uh, with the color commentary. You got me here, Hef, your old pal Hef. I'm your fashionista for vests and sweaters and, and all kinds of cool fashion statements. Hey, kindly smash that like button if you like us. And if you like Forrest Soapboxes, then definitely subscribe. He gets fired up sometimes, folks. Every now and again, yeah. I, I can let loose. It, it just depends on how how much outrage I'm feeling that day. <laughs> the Hulk rage. And we do have this wicked cool threat briefing email subscription you can get. Access to all of the top cyber news, the top breaches, the top stuff happening. It's a curated list that's available on our website. And we are... Security Metrics. We're here to help small businesses and large-sized businesses with access to affordable, high-quality, simple-to-use security, compliance, and network security tools. So without any further ado, we do our, have our top stories this week, Forrest. T-Mobile's sixth data breach ah, since 2018. We got to talk about this, Forrest. Um. Yeah, I know. The, the grinding of the teeth is pretty loud out there, folks. Healthcare data breaches are on the rise. 53% jump. We're going to talk about that. Yeah. And employees are taking a lot of cybersecurity shortcuts. And do they open you up to bad guys getting in your environment? And finally, our, our, our top story is, do you trust your smart TV? All that and more here on the Security Metrics News. <laughs> Oh my gosh, Forrest. I, you know, T-Mobile, man, what is up with them? Sixth uh, breach. Uh, I don't know where to begin with T-Mobile. Like We just talked about this breach that uh, they had, like, what, back in April, you said, I think? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, it was February. February, yeah. February. Ah, yeah. oh, my gosh. Oh, man. It's like, uh, hey, man, uh, do we need to lock our doors? Do we need to worry about cyber? You know, and you brought up a good point. I mean, you you said all these other service providers like Verizon and yeah. AT&T, yeah. they all have companies for cyber. Yeah, yeah. They're they're doing a lot more for cyber cyber. I mean, Verizon puts out like one of the industry leading like breach reports. Like that that's their thing that they're they're known for in the security community is like they are analyzing how these things are happening, you know, it, it just watching trends at large so they're they're very much aware i i would think that t-mobile having been the victim of five breaches now number six in the last three years Ridiculous. like that that's two breaches a year like at that point there's no excuse you, you should be tightening up your ship like so let's I, let's tell the audience exactly uh, what happened because uh the hackers ad referenced about 30 million t-mobile customers yeah. but i've heard interviews from the news site motherboard and they said something around 100 million so there is some controversy on exactly how many are impacted by this yeah yeah and and the the information seems to be pretty scant so i i moved i had previously been on google fi yeah. who was mvmno that used t-mobile uh and i i went to mint they also are another mvno that uses t-mobile's networks and uh yeah uh reaching out to their their people through you know the subreddits um it, it's it, the the response was was pretty um underwhelming and frustrating to say the least um yeah they they couldn't say uh what if any information they were sharing with t-mobile which is uh very frustrating in and of itself and yeah. it was essentially oh we just need to wait and see yeah and so it, it's like even if you're not going through t-mobile directly you could still potentially be impacted by these different breaches like i mean granted they they may not have all the same information like you know, I, I don't have a, a credit account with T-Mobile because, you know, I'm, I'm not like leasing a phone or whatever. But so, you know, they're not going to have the, the financial information associated with that. But yeah. still, I, I don't know. This is a big impact yeah. for us because we're talking about here not just T-Mobile customers themselves, but, you know, Boost and anyone else that may have a prepaid account. Those people also get impacted by this. The word that we're understanding from Twitter, the Twitterverse that's out there, is that it was a misconfigured GPRS gateway. And that is how this breach happened. But it's, uh, I'll tell you for us, T-Mobile is really good at sponsoring arenas and, you know, like football yeah. stadiums and stuff. 
not yeah. so good on the cybersecurity yeah, side of the yeah. house. I mean, like AT and T bought uh, Alien Vault. You know, their Open Threat Exchange. So they're yeah. they're. I mean, they're very heavily involved in you know the cybersecurity scene. I think the only thing I've seen from T Mobile was like uh, a Honey Pot yeah, that they nothing, put out. Nothing. Yeah, it's 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 like okay, like. That's neat and all, like, cool, thank you for making that open source. I do appreciate that contribution, but um, I don't know. How how much, yeah, how much introspection are you guys actually leveraging here? Well, let's tell the audience at home what you can do about it. So obviously you have one choice, which is to switch providers. You got to do what's best for you and your family. And T-Mobile put out a notice saying all, all customers, they need to change their account PIN, which is something Forrest has talked about in the past um, when when Mint got breached, for yeah. example. But of course, there's other things that people can do. And I guess there's a challenge and uh, there's a scaredness that comes with this because so many people have their phone number tied to all their online accounts. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's that's a big, uh, <coughs> uh, big attack surface for sure. Um, uh, a lot of this does take some measure of pre-planning. Mm -hmm. um, you, you need to go into it assuming that any information that you're going to give to a company will potentially be breached at some point. So um, wherever possible, I am a big advocate for just giving them garbage data. Like, does this does this company really need to know my real name? No? Okay. Uh, I am now John Smith, you know? Hi, John Smith. Hey. We should start this show over with you as John Smith. <laughs> hey. But in many cases, though, Forrest, your phone number is tied to your profile, yep. and that's hard to do. That's hard to remove a phone number when yep. it's tied to an app. Yeah. And a lot of these these companies, they'll reset your password, and they send you that SMS text message, yep. which, I mean, this, this practice of doing that is so widespread where your mobile phone number is your de facto identity document in yep. your life. Yeah, yeah. It's, and it's tough. One, one thing that you can try and do is uh, set up multiple, like VoIP numbers, like get get uh, like a Google Voice or yeah. uh, MySudo or one of those kinds of services where you can have multiple phone numbers and you can try segregating and keeping it um, specific to a purpose. Like, okay, this is my this is my work number. This is my you know highly sensitive like financial number. This is my garbage number. Whatever you know. That way you have some some isolation. That if one of those gets compromised in some way, then. Uh, hopefully it'll, it'll end up limiting the impact of it. Uh, there's a, uh, there's a guy, uh, goes by the name of, uh, Michael Basil. Um, I don't know that that's his real name. I don't think it is. I think his real first name is Michael. <laughs> Michael. Uh, yeah, that but, sounds right. But, uh, he, he puts out, uh, a book called Extreme Privacy and he goes over some, uh, very in-depth techniques for basically trying to, to protect your identity as much as possible in all aspects of your life. I mean, he, he gets a little crazy with it, like, you know, setting up everything in LLCs and never buying anything in your real name. And wow. like, he, he's yeah. like, that's a he's, little intense for most yeah, of us. Yeah. yeah. He's, he's working with people that it's like, if your, your privacy gets breached, you're probably going to end up dead. Like that's yeah. the level that he's working with, but he does have some very good, uh, general advice, uh, that, that, uh, he offers. I, I definitely recommend checking out his materials for sure. One thing that my family does is we don't use SIM cards. We have a SIM free household. <laughs> we do not allow any sort of SIM card in any device whatsoever. So we do have other stories to get to though. We got to move on. And, and one other story that came up this week was the Memorial health system, which is a hospital system based in Virginia, West Virginia and Ohio. They got popped this week, three hospitals. Yeah. It happened about early Sunday morning. Yeah. The IT infrastructure team there said, uh, yeah, yeah, the infrastructure's not working right now. And, uh, you're all going to have to use paper charts. You know, it's like, Ooh, but but we do have attribution on that case. We do have it attributed to Hive. Yeah. And they are the new dogs on the block, aren't they? June 25th, Hive came on the block. Uh, yeah. It was uh, uploaded the first sample to VirusTotal. And Hive is unique in that if you are a small to medium-sized business, you definitely want to listen up to this part of the presentation because Hive has been specifically targeting small to medium-sized businesses. Yeah, yeah. It's it's. I think they've only had like two attacks where they've been like fairly large organizations. I yeah. think one was like 2,500 computers or something. I think it was Atlas Group was the big one. The first time that it, the first big commercial Atlas Group was hit by Hive. But there are a lot of factors involved. Uh, and in fact, there's, there's uh, the threat factors that you need to be concerned about is this double extortion thing, which is what Hive, the ransomware gang, is known for. So what they do is they essentially, they will encrypt your local data and then they will exfiltrate it. 
and then they will ask for a ransom. But the unique thing about Hive is, uh, as as far as we understand it, they are so new that getting the decryption tools to work, their their program is still in development. So there's significant flaws. So even if you pay the ransom with Hive, you may find that the decryption tools don't even work on your environment. Yeah. So what can you do about that for us? Oh man. Backups, um, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. A lot of this just comes down to having proper disaster recovery in place. Like, yeah. like just plan, plan for the worst possible thing to happen and, you know, try and try and get, you know, processes and procedures to cover that. I mean, the, the thing that really sticks out to me was the, the sheer impact, uh, that this had, oh, I, you know, it, like it's three different hospitals, all of their emergency departments are um, now on di- diversion. All radiology is on diversion. Yeah. Um, surgeries have been canceled. Like this is this is life changing for yeah. these folks that need this a- absolute medical care. And you're oh, talking yeah. about a market like West Virginia, which is not exactly a hotbed city. It's not a huge city, so these rural hospitals really need their stuff to be up and operational. Yep. Uh, this is interesting though with Hive, uh, their their stuff primarily targets Windows machines. I know it's it's written in Go, the programming language Go. Yeah, it can hit 32-bit and 64-bit machines. So, but the Windows machines are the ones that you're not, you have to be really concerned about with yeah. Hive. Kind of kind of an interesting callback to the the previous episode where we were talking about, you know, threat threat actors uh, developing tools using these these different uh exotic programming uh, programming language. languages yeah. and to see it pop up and go it's like oh yeah, yeah. that's a good show hey, folks if you have not seen that we're talking about we have a, a segment about exotic programming languages that are now being used to write malware and you definitely want to take a look at that and we'll include that link below but so this there is some stuff that's going on that beyond the memorial hospital healthcare breach is that uh, we, we featured a story a few months ago from San Diego and Scripps Health Network. Mm-hmm. And yep. if you recall for us, that was a pretty damaging yeah, that was, that ransomware was attack. Yeah. The news came out and said there was a $106.8 million loss. Yeah. And boy, I'll tell you, that's a heartbreaking for Scripps Healthcare. And anytime you, you throw in that kind of money around, what's, what's getting that number for us so high? In terms of losses, can you can you it's, give us an idea? Of uh, the why? vast majority of it, my understanding was lost revenue. Um, they they were not able to to provide any services, so they couldn't charge anyone for yeah. those services. So they're just bleeding money out the entire time that they they can't generate any revenue. What I thought was really interesting about this was they did get an insurance payout. Uh, oh, they did! I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah to the tune of five point nine million. Ooh, that so, doesn't cover much. No, no. You're like, okay, we're we're down 108. Here's six million. You know, stretch wow. that out, make that last you. Wow. So if if you're depending on on cybersecurity insurance to to help nope. you out, then no. Like the the insurance company is not going to be your friend. I I can guarantee that they are operating on a profit profitability <laughs> model. So, well, yeah. Well, uh, Forrest, continuing on this theme of hospitals being hit yeah. and the amount of losses, it's it's amazing to see too that there was a report that came out, the Perspectives and Healthcare Security Report. It was actually a study done by Phillips and Cyber MDX, and what we've seen in the last I'd say six, seven, eight months is a tremendous number of vulnerabilities that have been targeting the healthcare operations. So we're talking about uh, last week, I think it was the the, the pipes, the, uh, what do they call those uh, things? The pneumatic tubes. Yeah, the yeah. pneumatic tubes like had a vulnerability you, you, in hospitals. You get at the bank, or yeah, bank tellers, yeah. Yeah. Boom. <laughs> well, the, the report that came out from this Perspectives and Healthcare Security Report said basically 48% of U.S. hospitals have disconnected their networks in the past six months to ransomware. And this study, they interviewed a bunch, a bunch of just CISOs and IT directors that work yeah. for hospitals. And that's how they got all some Bi- fascinating yeah. stats. Biomed tech, yeah. Uh, so, so basically what they're saying is in this report, uh, medium-sized hospitals, they appear to suffer the most uh, impact from such attacks. And that makes Makes sense. Yeah, uh, the know, proportional the staff, damage. Yeah, yeah, smaller staff. Large facilities, on the other hand, had an average of about six point two hours of downtime, and that seems low to me. But I, I don't know, Forrest. The amount of redundancy and segmentation at larger facilities is is a little bit better than what you might find at sometimes a smaller to medium sized hospital. So yeah, yeah, most definitely. It's it's especially you start to see a lot higher. Um, uh, level of of segmentation and security 
and best practices, yeah. right? I mean, cyber the, hygiene stuff is happening. Yeah, the the bigger facilities are going to be able to afford the more experienced folks that are, you know, it, it's it just comes with the territory. It's it's like any other business. I mean, if if yeah, if all you can can get is your uh, once every other weekend, your your uh, cousin who who happens to do <laughs> IT on the side. Hey, you know, Jamie, come on over. I got a, I got a nuclear treadmill you got to look at, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, but you know, mid-sized hospitals in the report said they had an average of about 10 hours of downtime and that was about $47,000 per hour like times 10 hours of downtime. So that adds up real yeah. quick. Oh yeah. Some other factors they mentioned in the report is the skills gaps of employees of yeah. it employees specifically, not also doing any sort of investment, large scale investment in cybersecurity that came up. So, uh, they did mention that cybersecurity is a high priority, but the budget still is not matching what the intentions are of protecting the hospital. So yeah, yeah. You can talk the talk, but, uh, money talks better. Yeah. The other thing that came up in this report is the number of legacy vulnerabilities. And oh, what, what yeah. does that mean for oh, the audience if oh, they've never yeah. heard that term? Um, yeah. So a lot of this is just uh, known vulnerabilities that uh, have already been patched that uh, are still present in, in the environment. And we see this time and time again. Yeah. I mean, it, it, uh, a couple episodes we, we referenced a, a stat that it was like 60% of uh, breaches that, that come from a vulnerability. The vulnerability was like over five years old. Wow. Like, wow. It, it, this is like just, Blue Keep, WannaCry, yeah, Beta. I yeah. mean, stuff we've talked about yeah, years ago yeah, that's Petya, still coming yeah. back. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's just like, oh, guys, like just, I, I would rather, much rather take a downtime hit for installing a patch and, you know, getting things back in order yeah. than I would... Uh, getting downtime by getting owned by ransomware. Yeah. You know, I mean, the damage just is too great, especially yeah. when you're talking about people's lives on the line. Oh, yeah. It stinks for us. You know what stinks? Oh, stinks to high heaven. Ransomware in a sewage plant. Yeah. It's a oh, uh, yucky, yucky, it's yucky, a man. Real crappy situation. It, whoa, you, that's a good pun there, bro. Wow. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so not only does it stink and not only is it tough, but this happened in northern Maine. And the key takeaway here is here is a sewage plant pretty much in the middle of nowhere yep. that's being targeted by threat actors. And you would think, like, oh, they would go after the big sewage plants like cities in New York and and uh, L.A., right? No, no, Forrest. Opportunistic. Man. Opportunistic, yeah. yeah. I mean, sometimes you just go for the low-hanging fruit because it's right there. You know, yeah. it's it, it may not have as big a payoff, but I mean, really, if you're just operating on a broad base, you're just, you know, throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, it, it comes back to... Uh, the, the origin of this was, uh, an old windows seven machine. Isn't that something? Uh, so once again, uh, I, I heard a line that was, that just encapsulates this so well. Um, and it, it was, uh, ransomware is the repo man for technical debt. <laughs> That's a good way to put it out there. And, yeah. yeah it, it's, you have all of this, this old infrastructure that, that, has just been neglected for so long and you know at some point they're they're going to come to collect yeah they are uh in this situation the computer shut down it did take offline there were offline alarms that alerted the workers that if the pumps overheat or the tanks get overfilled that they get the notification but again the key takeaway though is these old obsolete legacy computer systems still operating in these environments and uh, the good thing is the it was highlighted in the news article in the AP wire that they have earmarked a budget to replace this equipment but again it's too late at this point yep. you've already have ransomers that have been in your, ran, these third actors in your environment they know potentially have mapped your entire environment and know what's next so it's a it's a challenge for sure. Hey, Forrest, I meant to ask you: Did you happen to get a letter from Colonial Pipeline yet? Uh, no, thank thank goodness. Uh, uh, apologies to anybody out on the uh, East Coast or down in the Gulf who may have been impacted by this. They're finally sending out their letters. How yeah. long does this take? Uh, I mean, Forrest, this happened what? Three months. Three months three to months get a, a letter yeah. from almost, Colonial. Almost to the day. I think it was a little over three months. Yeah. Let me tell you the difference, though. So I just got a bunch of letters about a breach happening. Uh, the UMC, what was it? The, the healthcare hospital in Las Vegas mm. sent me four, five, six. I mean, I got a stack of letters wow. from these guys. That breach just happened. I want to say maybe two yeah, and a half. That was three that was weeks like ago. three weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah, and I already got a letter from them. Stacks of letters 
for everyone in my family, you know, hey, this this happened. So yeah. there's a huge difference in the response by oh, organizations. Yeah. And that, that's something you need to be aware of as well. Yeah, I mean, that kind of goes back to the the whole we need, you know, something at a federal level defining, yeah. you know, the the response on these these kinds of things, because notifications is just it's the Wild West, you know, it is. All right, Forrest, time for our top stories. This is my favorite part of the show. I love talking about the top stories. I also like talking about your soapboxes, but we'll, we'll oh, get to that here is, in, in just a moment. This Wait, is definitely a soapbox moment here. Forrest, you know, do you trust your smart TV? Oh, I don't trust smart anything. Let's ask oh. the, the audience, leave us a comment if you would like to share with us if you trust your smart TV, because we're going to show you a video here, a minute long video, and this video is going to really drive home how dangerous smart TVs are, not only in your home, but in your office too. Let's set up the audience though first for understanding this video. So Forrest, let's just say you you have a, a person in your environment, maybe they're disgruntled, maybe they want a little, a little bit of extra cash, an insider threat. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. And they meet somebody at a park and that person says, hey, I'll pay you some money. All I want you to do is stick this little device, a USB rubber ducky, it's called. And when you're when you're going around cleaning those offices, I just want you to stick it in the TV that's in the boardroom. OK. And can you do that for me? You know, yeah. so what I mean, is what is a, a, a rubber ducky? Because you're going to see that here in the video. They're going to the, the person is going to stick this rubber ducky into the smart TV. Yeah. So rubber duckies are a little USB device just looks like any other flash drive. You know, it's it's just a tiny little device. You just plug it into a USB port. And uh, what it does is it does keystroke emulation. So uh, it just when you plug it into the computer, it just looks like a USB keyboard to the computer. And uh, you can load it up with all kinds of scripts. They have, uh, there's like an open community of scripts that people have written for these things. And uh, it just does uh, keystroke injections and it can do, you know, timing. So, you know, send it some keystrokes, wait for the computer to respond, do some more. So it's essentially like a hacker is sitting right at the keyboard, right? Um, and these things are, are uh, super ubiquitous like they're they're dirt cheap you can build your own from existing usb flash drives if it has the right controller uh there's a few variants out there uh bad usb and whatnot but i mean heck if if you're not that technically inclined you can just buy one for 50 bucks like yeah. you you could easily do this stuff yourself um and yeah again whatever a bad guy can do sitting at your keyboard they can do with this this device and there's there's even some some pretty advanced ones like uh there's one called the OMG cable. Yeah. Uh, looks like a, just a regular USB cable. Has all the same capabilities, except it also has additional stuff like uh, remote access over Wi-Fi. So once it's plugged in, an attacker can then send commands uh, from their computer, you know, sitting out in the parking lot or whatever. So, so here you go, folks. Yeah. You're going to see this video. And again, what you're going to see is after the rubber ducky device gets plugged into the smart TV, you're going to see a guy sitting on a bench just right outside the office building. And he is going to try to record everything that's being projected on this television. Take a look. Folks, I hope you enjoyed that video. It really does show you how quickly your environment can be compromised by a rogue insider. And you, you really do get a feel for it. Wow, this this can happen pretty darn fast. Yeah, yeah. It's, right underneath your nose. Yeah, the uh, the classic evil maid uh, <laughs> yeah, attack. Yeah. 
all right, so let's talk about one, a couple more things here for us. we got to talk about healthcare data breaches are on the rise. And this is another interesting report. This came out from Constanella, uh, 2021 Identity Breach Report. And what they did is they went out and they analyzed over 8,500 breaches and leakages in the past year. Over 12 billion data records for it. That's a lot of That's stuff being lot. sold in the underground marketplaces all over 2020. Oh, yeah. And what they found was that 60% of data breaches across sectors expose some sort of PII. Yep. And that aligns with what the data we have, which is the value of PII on the dark web and how much it's being sold for. But 72% of all these breaches included passwords. So threat actors are finding some deep value in that. I think the key takeaway, though, was the data around healthcare. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's uh, just, yeah, like you touched on, the the volume of data is is going up the rate of leakage for us yeah, specifically increased about 51 percent yep. for healthcare, and that is just unbelievable that yeah. just knocks your socks off yeah the the costs are going up they're becoming more and more common um you know the the, the ransomware gangs are less likely to to restore uh your data or keep it confidential if they're doing you know a yeah. double extortion uh kind of attack there's no guarantee that they're going to actually keep their word on that. Like it's you're you're dealing with some pretty scummy people that are locking down hospitals to begin with, or medical facilities, or whatever. Like these people don't have a very strong moral framework. So yeah, yeah. we'll we'll include a linky in the description. And the the thing too is that ransomware piece for us was so prevalent throughout that report, three hundred thirty seven percent rise in the the payments to attackers from twenty nineteen to twenty twenty. Yeah. Ooh, that's that's just something else. So there are some lessons learned though, and we should share those. That um, the, the ransomware groups, I think you briefly mentioned this, that they're getting more hostile. They're they're even if you pay the ransom, they're not restoring it. Um, they're they're unlikely to 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 restore the system. So that's a key takeaway. Also, uh, you're you're gonna hear that that the the consistent theme is that multiple ransomware gangs are targeting the hospital sector. It's not just one or two, but uh, there's different shadowy hacking groups. There's also insider employees that are snooping around trying to make a bank. So the situation's not going to get any better before it gets no. any worse. So you got you got to understand that a proactive approach is key and and hitting the entire landscape and protecting those crown jewels and having that strategic and tactical approach is is necessary. Yeah, definitely needs to be taken seriously. Uh, as you've mentioned before, you know, failing to plan is planning to fail. Yeah. And I, I think at this point, anybody that is in any sort of healthcare adjacent uh, uh, organization really does need to, to do some intros introspection and make sure, are we actually trying to cover our bases here? Yeah, yeah. All right, a couple more stories, and then we're going to wrap it all up here. A lot of employees are taking shortcuts, and this article caught my attention because there's so much good cyber hygiene in it that I think we need to talk about it here. And, and you know, recommendations for us, when you hear stories like this, that employees are working remote or they're working in the office, they're taking these cybersecurity shortcuts, they're not understanding the risks for us of their behavior, their day-to-day -day behavior in their environment, that is, oh, that just breaks my heart. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I like to try and take a blameless approach where it's like, oh, well, you know, it's easy to point fingers and say, well, you know, this person just used a crappy password or whatever. And it's like, yeah. No, like, like maybe there's a problem with your password policy. Like maybe there's a reason that they chose a crappy password yeah. or, you know, maybe the problem is that you're using passwords period for all these different services. Like maybe you should be considering a uh, single sign on or some kind of credential management where you, you, you know, you're taking that completely out of their hands. So they can't make a crappy password. It's all randomly generated. They don't know it. They just sign in once and then everything else is taken care of from there. Like, yeah, it's a force. There's such a disconnect right now between the employees understanding of what the cybersecurity risks are in their business, in their environment or in their role. And then how they actually execute their daily tasks. And this this is an awareness issue. This is a training issue. And it can also be a business issue. And and that's what we, we said this before multiple times on the program, that it's always about doing what's best for the business. And I know we we don't want to be perceived as like the police department. Yeah. But you, it can be tough to try to manage that. I mean, you really have to ask yourself for us, how much risk do these behaviors by these employees that don't understand the risk, how much, how much risk are they actually creating for the business? Yeah. Yeah. So, it's, it's always a, a balance between security and convenience, right? It's a lot of it is just identifying 
you know, how much risk does this pose and, you know, how, how much effort would it take to alleviate it? You did mention a couple of bullets, and I just want to recap them very quickly here. Employees saving passwords in their browsers, that's a risk. Uh, employees connecting to public Wi-Fi, uh, unsecure, dangerous, that's a risk. Uh, employees recycling passwords across multiple sites. We mentioned this countless times. Oh, man. Yeah, I use the, yeah I'm going to use my Netflix password for my work password. Uh, employees using personal devices on the corporate network. I mean, these are all risks where the behavior, there's a disconnect between the employee and their role. Uh, employees, uh, they said in this article, 18% of, uh, of employees were using the password for personal use in a work context. Employees are also visiting a tremendous number of unauthorized sites. And then, of course, employees use, using similar shared credentials with colleagues. That's a, that's a key takeaway. So be aware of it. We'll include the, the link in the uh, description. You can definitely click on it and, and read some more about this article. I thought it was fascinating. We have a couple more items to talk about here, and this is always the part of the presentation. People love your soapboxes for us. I get a lot of feedback on the soapboxes. So let's talk about your first soapbox, which is Accenture downplaying ah, ransomware. You've seen this before. Man. Stop me if you've heard this before. Yeah. This is nothing important, folks. Move along. Move along. Yeah. So this happened August 11th, and uh, th what happened was the, year, the company information got published on the dark web. As far as we understand it, it was the Lockbit ransomware cartel. They, the 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 reason why Accenture is downplaying it is because they said, you know, it's just some employee training courses, some marketing materials for us. I mean, that stuff's not important, right? But, you know, that's all they're telling us. So we don't know what else is involved in that. And 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 that's the kind of damage that comes from this, where they, they think just because the data doesn't have much value to the company that it's not important. But the reality is any sort of leakage of intellectual property, um, plans, strategy, that kind of stuff that gets out there, it's never coming back to the yeah. company. Yeah. And, and the, the thing that I thought was really interesting about this was, um, you know, there was, there was some, some speculation online, uh, as to some of the attribution here. Yeah. Uh, and supposedly some, you know, Lockbit was saying that, uh, they were able to get in uh, because of an insider. That's what I heard too. Uh, yeah, who is supposedly still actively employed with the company, uh, yeah. which is absolutely terrifying in my mind. Because uh, yeah, while uh, initially the 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 breach may have been for you know their their own internal stuff. Uh, I but mean, what if, else? If, yeah. What else could the threat yeah. actor pivot towards now exactly. that this this is out there? Exactly. This is, folks. This is one of the largest multinational corporations on the planet, cyber insurance provider, and we're talking. They had a data leak, all right, and it, and it's 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 unacceptable how they're downplaying it, and it's 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 a uh, it's a travesty, really. It is. There is something else for us before we move off this and and end the presentation. Uh, education giant Pearson they got fined a million dollars for downplaying their data breach. And the way their data breach went down is, if you recall, it happened in about 2018, and it actually got leaked to the news media. And then the news media is the one that said, hey, what's going on here? And Pearson tried to play it off like, oh, it was just a little bit of, of your students' names and your children's dates of birth and their social security numbers. That's it, folks. Nothing else. That's the kind of stuff. This And this was attributed to Chinese hackers, if I recall. So, uh, yeah, downplaying these data breaches is a continuous theme that we keep seeing. And it's got to stop. It's, it's, it's absolutely travesty. Yeah, most definitely. All right, so folks, that's it. That's our show. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we did talking to you about it. Yeah, please, please, please hit that smash. Smash that like button for us. And, um, you know, Forest Soapboxes will continue if you keep subscribing. And we do have that amazing curated list that we put together every week of the top cyber stories that you can subscribe to. And, again, as beha on behalf of myself and Mr. Forrest, you guys have a great week. Yeah, take care. Yeah.